Hey everybody, I'm Dan LaPelle for New Focus Recordings. Uh, very grateful to be joined by Chris Trapani. We're gonna talk about Horizontal Drift, which comes out this Friday, April 15th, 2022. Hey Chris, how's it going? Hey Dan, thanks for having me here. Welcome from LA. Uh, most of these we end up doing, I feel like I'm in the same time zone, but every once in a while we have this sort of uh, cross time zone type of Zoom situation, which is fun. Um, so, well, I don't know, let's, let's, you know, my first inkling of this project, I think was when I heard Marilyn Nankin perform Lost Time Triptych on a concert with the Grise piece. I, I mean, I don't know that I knew that, or maybe you didn't even know that this was going to become an album, but, uh, that might've been the first point of contact that I had with any of these pieces. And and I guess in some sense with this direction in your writing, though I know you've done tons of stuff with microtonality for for years, but the idea of a, a, a sort of rigging instruments and or you know sort of adjusting instruments, but maybe talk about it a bit more and, and how this has been part of your work for a while. Sure. Well, I guess that this had been you know sort of percolating around then. That would have been. 2016, I guess, that Marilyn premiered those pieces. And uh, I sort of had the idea around then of doing, you know, a CD that would showcase all of the solo pieces that I've been writing for unusual instruments. You know, what I, I had, you know, gotten a little bit disappointed with the idea of writing these ensemble pieces that are just performed once or twice. And I was trying to reevaluate my own perspective of like, you know, where do I really want to be investing my time as a composer? And the thing that started to make sense to me was working with the idea of tailoring pieces to very specific individuals so that we could get, you know, just a fantastic recording and uh, disseminate that rather than trying to write pieces that multiple pianists or flutists would pick up. And I found that to be a really inspiring and liberating idea, knowing that the performance opportunities were sort of limited for the pieces that I'd be writing. Uh, it gave me the courage to kind of invest a little bit more as a composer into making uh, one-offs or more unique pieces. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, it's sort of, it, it points to a different kind of album, album making, I think, and what we think of as the sort of standard uh, intention to have something that's going to enter the repertoire for everybody. But obviously, yeah, I mean, it's not, there's, there might be some people who will take up the quarter tone guitar piece or, but I, it takes a certain kind of investment from the performer to, to want to play any of this rep, rep which is, uh, which is in some ways probably good because that means that that's the kind of person who's going to re really spend time with the score and yeah i found it to be really gratifying you know yeah. working with with you and with marilyn with everyone on this cd mm -hmm. and writing you know really tailored pieces that sure they do take more investment but uh hopefully there's some payoff absolutely well should we start by listening to a little bit of the the opening track, or let's talk about it first, introduce it a bit, uh, Targul. Sure, because that's maybe for, well, it's hard to say the most unusual instrument on this CD, but it's definitely one that sure. as soon as I've hand the CD to people, they say, what is this instrument? Yeah, uh, It's the Viowara Kuguarna, which is a Romanian folk instrument uh, that's kind of based on the, the Stro violin principle. And that is, I guess, a violin with a wooden body but a skinny wooden body and then a metal horn that sticks out of it to project the sound so these were made you know in the early 20th century so that violins could compete with wind and brass instruments on one mic recordings and then i think the story goes that there was this uh, maker from the western part of romania who saw one in a museum and who just decided to start making his own. So it's caught on, but only in one 
particular region of, of Romania that's very close to Hungary. It's caught on to the point where it's the uh, emblem of the local football team. And of course he refined his design and over the years, and now they have like competitions for the best Violara Kuguarna player. Uh, so I traveled to Romania back in 2015, I think, and I bought one of these instruments and you know, I was just fooling around with it and talking to some friends. And I realized that uh, Max Haft, who's a violinist, uh, half American, half Belgian, lives in Switzerland now. Uh, Max was writing a doctorate on the Strove violin and the Viola Cuguarna. And so we got in touch. I invited him to Rome when I was living there and he played my instrument and we just sort of immediately agreed to collaborate as soon as we could find the occasion. And the result is this piece called uh, Targu, which means like a, a feast or a festival or kind of an agreement uh in Romanian and yeah it's it, it's a wild piece sort of has a folkloric inspiration behind it and oh maybe the last thing I should say is that the electronics come out of two megaphones rather than traditional speakers so just the electronics themselves also have this gritty lo-fi quality to them that kind of goes with the nature of the instrument very cool Let's let's take a listen to the opening minute, right? That's yep. good. Great. So here's Targul, uh, Max Haft, 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 Max Haft, Max Haft on uh, Viora K Guarna. I probably masticated that, but here we go. All the same. Very cool. Uh, so the piece I played on on this record, Horizontal Drift for quarter tone guitar and uh, live electronics, links to another sort of side of your work that I'm aware of from your record, Waterlines, uh, which is like sort of a New Orleans influence, I guess, in a sense, right? But this, this time it's a bit more, I guess, abstract, right? It was partially the title. Uh, yeah, the title, well, I took the title from a, a book by one of my favorite writers, Jeff Dyer. Yeah. And it's a, a book of sort of short travel stories called Yoga for People Who Can't Be Bothered to Do It. <laughs> and the first story, Horizontal Drift, uh, first piece, I should say, takes place in New Orleans, and he's recounting his own time living there and talking about how the the city, you know, we all sort of know this, that New Orleans is built on uh low ground below sea level for the most part and the city sinks slowly but it also drifts uh, a certain distance every year horizontally and so because it's some of the most the freshest uh, alluvial land in the country the, the city's constantly sort of moving and um so yeah, but at a glacial, languorous, southern pace. And that's kind of the pacing of the piece. Wow. Of course, I thought about horizontal drift also applying to, well, in the piece that applies to the world of timing, because the electronics are recording these loops and stretching them out and making it into this very uh, spacious, constantly uh, dense, almost like pushing through molasses feeling over the course of several minutes. 
but also it applies to the world of pitch because the uh, the, the chords that you're hearing in the loops, they tend to get transposed slightly. And because we're working on a quarter tone grid, I can transpose them by quarter tones by 50 cents or 150 cents. And yeah, so there's a more, I, I think of that somehow as relating to the theme of the Jeff Dyer piece, this gradual slide into new territory. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I think also uh, some of the guitar writing itself sort of seems to be little deconstructed blues fragments in a way, a little glissandi and, and uh, grace notes and stuff um, that are just sort of percolating in the texture and then driving this, this languorous electronic part. So it's a, a really a sort of effective piece very atmospheric for sure there's a lot of uh folk inspired writing yeah um yeah jazz idiom but also i remember saying to you in the recording session oh this should sound like a Joni mitchell that's right yeah, of, yeah you know these low slaps on the chop and and chop uh sort of yeah. chop sound yeah yeah definitely that harmonic world too i mean I guess I push it a little further, but I think of uh, Joni Mitchell exploring these chains of consonances that kind of just drift into one another and don't have your typical one, four, five structure, right? Yeah, well, not to mention she's sort of a pioneer in using unorthodox uh, tunings in, in, in pop songwriting. And this this piece also is, on top of it being a quarter tone fretboard, it's, it's in a scordatura. Uh, yeah. including one string that's tuned down by a quarter tone and right. <laughs> right, right. make it tough to follow. Did you find it uh, challenging to tackle this piece? Yeah, I was. it was definitely a challenge. I mean, uh, it's the first piece I'd ever done on a 24 EDO system. Um, I think just that, you know, physically uh, training yourself to be sort of 50 percent or 100 percent more precise with your your fretting hand or whatever so you're really getting those quarter tones uh and then added to that the scordatura I'm, I'm definitely used to doing plenty of pretty out there scordatura and microtonal stuff on a 12 video fretboard but i basically sure. just had to make up a metric matrix for myself especially for the quarter tone tune string um but once i got probably it, oh sorry go ahead well, I was just going to mention, you know, the circumstances of how this piece came about. This was a commission from a Finnish guitar player, yeah. named Yuso Niemann. And Yuso contacted me. And, you know, really the reason I accepted this commission is he said, I want you to write a piece for me for quarter tone guitar. And if you agree, I'll send you one. Right. So I still have his quarter tone guitar and hey, we used it to record. Don't I actually still have this quarter tone? You actually do have the quarter tone yeah, guitar, yes. Yeah. I don't know if uh, Yusu, Yusu is going to see this video or not, but we promise to give it back as soon as you ask for it. Um, Absolutely. It's a beautiful instrument, too. Uh, but yeah, it, well, I think also we, we decided to record the piece, I think, sensibly without the live electronics. Yeah. Uh, which sort of added this really great uh, sort of enlightened surprise for me when I heard the, the final mix and it's just the piece sort of blooms and expands into the uh, into, into what it is now. So that was really cool, very gratifying. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Well, let's let's take a listen. Uh, this is an excerpt from Horizontal Drift for quarter tone guitar and live electronics. <laughs> Thank you. 
let's let's move on to uh, the piece I sort of briefly referenced before uh, that Marilyn Nankin is performing here, Lost Time Triptych, which was part of a project that she had to commission uh, pieces for a concert where Grise's Vortex Temporum was was also being uh, performed. Yeah, that's right. It grew out of uh, just a conversation that Marilyn and I had one day about uh, wouldn't it be great if there was a little more repertoire to go along with that piece because as some of our loyal viewers probably know that it requires retuning the piano. Four strings have to be tuned down by a quarter tone. And so that's uh, a lot to ask of a piano tech just for one piece. Right. Yeah, I remember, so that, if I'm remembering right, it was at Roulette, right? Uh, yeah. And I remember going to the concert and I knew of the piece, of course, but I didn't know the specifics of the retuning. And I think I actually found you after the performance and I was asking about the tuning and in my head, I was convinced it was, first of all, I was convinced it was fairly uh, sort of pervasive across several octaves. And sure. I also also was convinced that it was sort of overtone based. Uh, and then you you said, no, it's just four quarter tones. And I was just sort of blown away by what Grise, well, and you for that matter, were able to do in terms of, you know, the way that those four retuned notes shade everything. And yeah. you see all these voicings through these different prisms. It's not, it doesn't really feel like it opens one layer of like a different kind of listening matrix. It's like it opens up a whole prism of ways to understand the, the detuning. It's really fascinating. Yeah, and, and I've actually heard that more than once that, uh, you know, people expected that there were many more notes that yeah. were detuned on the piano. I mean, that's really a testament to Crise's creativity and yeah. recombining them and using them in so many different ways, but also, you know, how, we, how we've all gotten so used to hearing just this one piano soundboard resonant sound, how little it takes to disturb that and to give us yeah. the sense that we're in a bit of a different world. Yeah, really, I mean, it just sounds like a different instrument all of a sudden, it's really remarkable. But you're right that we've been so, uh, you know, accustomed to this sound, acclimated to this sound. And then that sort of suggests all these other interesting issues about how we've been so acclimated to equal temperament and then you hear repertoire in in older temperaments and it sort of blows your mind in in slightly different ways and um what are the four pitches again so they spell out a diminished uh seventh chord yeah there's the c below middle c and then there's you know moving upwards uh there's d sharp a and F, uh, F sharp, sorry, in the higher octave. So, and what's the the sort of overall uh, register between the lowest detune note and the highest detune note? They're not they're not in the same octave, right? They're in like several different octaves. No, let's. I'm, I'm going to turn around and demonstrate on the piano since oh, cool. we have one here. But I believe it's that C. D sharp, A, and F sharp. Okay. But it's cool. kind of all like mid register notes. Yeah. Um, but far enough away that it sort of uh, allows you as a composer to sort of be naturally migrating from register to register and, and organically including these pitches without it feeling like you have to sort of jump down. If you're up in the higher register, you had to jump down and sort of grab a pitch that was detuned. That seems like that might have been sort of strategic. I don't know. I mean, it'd be fascinating to find if Crise ever expanded on why he chose those specific notes, you know? We, we have a lot of Grise's sketches talking about the, the harmonic material for the piece. Yeah. And it's essentially based on uh, well, first of all, there's the there's the Ravel quote at the opening, this sort of 
uh, up and down stuff, but then there's uh, this arpeggio. And then uh, the harmonies are based on, you know, classic spectral techniques. Uh, these are pure spectra, these are dilated spectra, these are compressed spectra, rounded off to quarter tones. But yeah, he's trying to come up with things that maximize using these retuned pitches always against tempered pitches too to get that clash. Yeah, that's interesting that you say sort of rounded up. I guess that's probably, it's because of the way he's using those pitches and because of the way he's conceiving them as uh, manifestations of, of overtone relationships that it didn't sound like a quarter tone piece to me when I heard it, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a weird phenomenon, but I feel like I've noticed that in other pieces too. But there's a sound of like a quarter tone intentionality and then there's a sound of a spectral intentionality. And sometimes both can be true even if the tuning is literally in quarter tones, you know. Sure, yeah, it's sort of two separate things, yeah. Ways of understanding it, yeah. Cool, so well, let's, the, the first movement is is quite short. Uh, it's only 32 seconds, so maybe we can take a listen to the first movement, time is a jet plane, and then uh, a bit of the second movement, time is piling up. Yeah, that's, the idea is that there are three different uh, concepts of time that are in, expressed. And this is something I took directly from Krize, directly from the way he talks about vortex tempora. He had what he called the time of insects, where things happen super quickly. Then there's sort of normal human time. And then there's the time of the whales, he called it, where things happen on an elongated uh, time span. So yeah, I mimic that. I have a super short third movement, that uh, first movement, a normal sort of very contrapuntal second movement, and then finally the extreme dilation of a third movement that's actually longer than the first two put together. Right. Very cool. So here's Marilyn Nankin playing the first two movements of Lost Time Triptych. <laughs> It was cool to, to have a chance to briefly chat about these pieces. Do you want to brief sort of uh, briefly mention the other uh, the other three sure. works on the album? Sure. Yeah. Now you've heard half of the excerpts from half of the CD. Yeah. Uh, the other three pieces on there. There's one for uh, Amy Advocate, a clarinet player in Boston, and that's written for. Uh, a clarinet that is retuned to a very specific microtonal scale, the Bolin Pierce scale. Right. Then there's a piece for the Fokker organ, which is an organ in Amsterdam that's tuned to a 31 tone to the octave scale. Right. And that's a piece that it actually doesn't have a human performer. It was, I did it all on the computer and send it uh, via MIDI to the organ. And then the piece, uh, the CD ends with the piece uh, Tessere for Marco Fusi playing the viola d'amore, uh, which is also, you know, retuned and prepared and uh, has a lot being asked of it. 
Yeah, but yeah. Marco does a beautiful job playing this, you know, mostly modal piece for viola d'amore with electronics. Yeah, well, it's 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 a beautiful and fascinating CD, and uh, you know, I think very consistent with what you were going for in the sense that it's like it's it's these are all unique pieces. I mean, there's they they sort of stand apart from uh, other kinds of efforts which are a bit more down the middle in terms of entering the repertoire. These they they really uh, distinguish themselves and been very cool to be involved in it. So thank you. And, and thank you. Thanks to New Focus for, for oh, this and for all the work you do. Absolutely a pleasure. Uh, before we forget, let's mention some great people who were also involved in this. Uh, Ryan Streber recorded track two, Horizontal Drift. Uh, Paul Geluso recorded tracks four through six, uh, Lost Time Triptych. Camille Juliaris, uh, track eight, Tessere. And you recorded tracks one, three, and seven, uh, Targul, mm -hmm. Linear A, and 4949. And uh, the CD design and layout was Chaswell Jones, who's based in New Orleans. And I think that might be it. Did we get cover everybody? Anybody else you want to mention? We're good? It just about covers it, yeah. Great. Well, thanks again, Chris. Uh, to folks out there, looking uh, or watching this video. The album is out uh, April 15, 2022. It's on our website, it's on Bandcamp, it's on all the streaming services. If you'd like a physical CD, it's on places like Amazon, Archive, Barnes and Noble. And do check this this really unique and, and beautiful uh, album out. It's it's sort of in, a, in an era where the album feels sometimes like an endangered species. This is like making a very strong case for for why it is a, a very viable artistic format. So take a listen. All right, everybody. Well, thank you. Take care. And thanks again, Chris. We'll see you soon. Bye. Okay.